Dialogue at the Wilson Center is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And now here's your host, John Molusky. Hello and welcome to the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. This week, we welcome Catherine Lavelle back to the program. She is the Ellen and Dixon Long Professor of World Affairs in the Department of Political Science at Case Western University and is also a former Wilson Center Fellow. Today, we'll be talking about her newest book, Money and Banks in the American Political System. Everybody loves banks these days, right? They're just so popular. <laughs> Katie, welcome popular. back to Dialogue. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. Thank you. It's great to be here. L let me ask you first about the, the road to publication. What inspired uh, you to write this book? In the book, you talk about a variety of experiences in this town and elsewhere that led to this interest in this book. Well, I think this is really a book that could not have existed if it weren't for the Wilson Center, because I was a fellow here in 2008, and I had worked on oh, Capitol Hill timing two is everything. years before. And I said, no one's project changed faster in the first two weeks of September 2008 <laughs> than mine did. I was here to write a book about the IMF and the World Bank. And um, along the course of the year, we would have different sessions and, and programs on dialogue and, and brown bag gatherings and really a lot of informal ad hoc discussions across disciplines and across the policy and academic world that got me thinking about a lot of these issues and why no one had ever actually put it all together in one place about what makes the political system work here, not just the economic side, but what is it about banks in the political system that's so difficult for this country sometimes? Well, you know, and, and that's, that is the very interesting uh, idea that you, you present among others. And is, is it cultural? Is it something about uh, this sort of uh, American need to separate church and state in a way, or in this case, <laughs> yeah, that, the <laughs> private sector and the state in ways where we just can't even think clearly about it because we're so obsessed with that notion? I think it really re reflects our American political culture and the separation of power, but also our fear of the concentration of economic power. Mm -hmm. So as, as you pointed out, banks have been politically unpopular in a certain part of the American political system back to the founding of the country. In our unease, we, we delegated to Congress the, the authority to issue money, but then we've always had unease about whether or not there should even be a central bank that would control those activities. So we've had different arrangements over time, but all always a level of discomfort with the, that concentration of power. Is it possible, speaking of that power, is it possible to do some sort of a put it in perspective type uh, uh, explanation of how influential and powerful banks are compared to other industries? Right, you know, a lot of industries have lobbyists and campaign contributions. Yeah, so when I kind of started, is not a unique I thought, thing. you know, this is what we get from the kind of media that it's it's all the lobbyists. And as we say, it isn't like when you're on Capitol Hill, the bank lobbies just come up there and everyone says, "What can we do for you today?" Mm -hmm. There's a lot of contentious struggles and, and battles over banking politics. But what I want to add to the discussion is the bureaucratic layer, and that in Washington D.C. there are these agencies and regulators that have appeared as a result of different moments in our American experience that also compete for power. They compete for budgets. They compete for mandates. And in, when you start getting into the banking sector, the FDIC has to worry about protecting its deposit fund. The Federal Reserve has to worry about protecting its independence. So there are these institutional actors that also have political interests within the system and then the banks participate in each one of those processes. So are, are you describing essentially almost a built-in structural bias that doesn't even require all of the greasing of the skids of big lobbying money because there's a natural propensity to, to favor a certain industry? Well, what I hope to do with the book is show that the whole story isn't bad. So we've had this incredible decentralization of banking authority and governance in our country, but this has also allowed for an awful lot of financial innovation. And right now, financial innovation is, is a dirty word, but let's not forget that at one moment checking accounts were an innovation, ATM machines were an innovation, and some kinds of mortgage products were also useful in innovations. So there's a moment where the innovations can take an ugly turn, but there's also an awful lot of good that's been done by access, wide access to credit for many different groups in society. So both of these things take place together, what happens in industry, but also how our government responds. So back to those rankings, I'm compelled to, th to try again on the quantification. Are, are banks the, the on the short list of top three most influential, most 
powerful private sector uh, entities out there? Well, that's, that's for sure. They are yeah. powerful political actors. But what I also hope to bring to the discussion is some understanding within the financial services uh, world that big banks don't necessarily act the same way in politics and have the same interests as small banks. Banks that have big credit card businesses don't necessarily act the same way as banks that have big mortgage businesses. And so uh, what, what types of businesses they're engaged in and what part of the country also play into the political process and, and determine our structure. So we've had a concentration among a certain number of banks that are in the New York area and now some other financial centers like Charlotte. But um, across our history, we've also had uh, many small banks that have been able to work the political system to get certain benefits from it. So do the big banks give the small banks a bad name? <laughs> is it guilt by association? Yeah, well, that depends on when the crisis is. So another yeah. thing that I hope to do is, uh, is I hope to do with this is broaden the the frame of discussion and really take it back to well to the earliest founding of the country, but also to the Civil War and, and some of the earlier problems in 1907 and some of the earlier financial panics. Because a lot of what we do now is just look at the Great Depression and the reforms that come out of the Great Depression. And so at different moments, different actors have have been more or less of a problem for the system overall. Well, that, that touch point, that moment in history that inspired your work 2008 and that inspired this uh, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or precipitated this, this crash, w what happened? especially the role of the banks, since that's what we're here to talk about. What, right. What's your interpretation of what happened? Well, the way I look at it, across American history, we've had what I would call tanks, or uh, if I had to describe it, different tanks were kind of built up in the banking industry, and they were protected from the outside with regulation. And inside, people made a profit, but they didn't get super rich. When you look back to the 1970s and 80s, a series of legislation allowed these tanks to kind of flood into each other. So you have them doing things that they previously uh, offering products that they previously couldn't offer, but the old regulatory structure was still in place. So some of the old regulatory structure that protected certain areas now work to allow them to kind of game the system with, with newer financial products. And in 2008, clearly that framework was could not sustain the flooding of the tanks that had occurred within it. And so, uh, you know, as a result of the crisis, we have major reform legislation that is attempting to fix some of the, the problems with the previous system, but also introduce a new element, which is kind of common in American history, a new regulator that will serve the interests of the consumer in the financial marketplace. Could you give us an, a specific example of one of these tanks and one of these new products, especially sure. what I find almost mystical in trying to understand is this notion of financial products, this whole industry of things that people make a lot of money off of, but it, it's hard to quantify what they are. Uh, could you give us an, a, a concrete example of one of those and where it maybe ran into some difficulty because of this mixing of the tanks? Sure. Well, back in the 19, if we go back to the 40s even, people would go to an SNL mostly. Most uh, savings and loans provided people with a mortgage product, and then they would go to a different entity and have a checking account. And if they did have a credit card, they would get it from an issuer somewhere else, maybe even from just a department store. Maybe it wasn't a general Because these different types cards. of banks specialized in... in these right, and they were services? able to offer those products, and uh -huh. so so there were restrictions on how much interest you could earn or, or offer in different environments. And over time, what happened is that mortgages, rather than just being kept on the books of individual banks, became securitized. And then you had investment banks enter into the financial services marketplace, taking the mortgages off of the books of the bank, maybe even a day after it was made, so that your, your loan is no longer owned by the entity that made it. And you might go to the same bank where you have your checking account now to get your mortgage product. And, and so, like I say, then suddenly you're going, you can go to one bank and you can have your credit card. They can cross sell you a mortgage. They can cross sell you uh, maybe even a student loan. Back in the day, I had to go and get a student loan from a bank. Mm -hmm. So um, so suddenly you have, all, you have a financial services marketplace where previously you had to go to these different institutions for these products because that's the way they were created. Well, that, when you describe it as such, it sounds like a good thing. It sounds like a convenience for a consumer. Where does it take a wrong turn? Why does it become a bad thing? <laughs> well, this is open for great debate when it starts to be bad because for um, some people, I think uh, there's an o expansion in terms of who can borrow money. So I like to point out that women can, can single women can get loans now for mortgages where previously th that had been uh, not a possibility. But over time, as the financial services industry looked to make more profit, 
you can earn more profit when you're lending money to people who are a bigger risk. And, and when you are bundling these mortgages and taking them off of the books of the bank, the person who's actually lending or the entity lending the money doesn't necessarily take the same care that they would have had previously in making sure that that money is, is returned because it's no longer something they have to worry about. That's for the investor down the road that has purchased a security. And so as that process in the beginning accumulates, again, more people have access to credit. Maybe some of these people had really just made a few bad uh, decisions in the past and were worthy. But over time, you start to layer other financial products onto this. So you start to layer things like what most of us would look at and call insurance products onto it to ensure the security that is sold. And then you can offer other financial products that mirror the security and increase the order of magnitude of that particular security. And I think for most observers, once you start layering all of those products on so it becomes very clear, unclear rather, who is actually responsible for paying and who actually loses the money mm -hmm. if it's not repaid, that's where it, be it becomes a very serious so, problem. So where, so where do we place the blame when things go as badly wrong? And I don't mean that in the, in the partisan uh, political mm -hmm. way. I'm yeah. thinking more of what went wrong as far as the balance between innovation and, and regulation. When you, especially when you've uh, tracked this historically from the founding, is there a period you could point to where we get the equation just about right? <laughs> and then why does it yeah. drift away from that, that, that stability? Yeah, well, again, everyone's going to point to a different moment. I think that most analysts would look at the end of the Depression and say what, what was necessary in that time was to carve out a space where people who didn't want to engage in speculative activity could go to a bank, earn a certain rate of interest, and move on with their lives. And so I always like to say people kind of in the Midwest who are, are getting on their cops, their firefighters, their teachers, those kinds of people who really aren't interested in speculation have a clear understanding and when they're speculating and when they aren't. And, and that line was drawn in the 1930s with the Glass-Steagall. In other words, the if, they th if they think that their uh, retirement money is safe and stable, and until later they find out, surprise, not so okay. Right, so and, and I think that's where, the, that's where the problem comes, when you no longer understand where that line is drawn. Now, I think the, the, the reform legislation that came out of 2008, the Dodd-Frank legislation, attempted to try to redraw some kind of barrier. But what a lot of what my book points out is the, the devil's in the detail. So the, the legislation comes out, but then it has to go through the rulemaking process in these agencies. And that's where, again, some of the lobbies and some of the influence of the financial services industry comes in. And some of those um, rules haven't been written definitively yet. Mm -hmm. So we can't really make a judgment about whether or not we've recreated that situation. Whether Dodd-Frank works forward. or not. We, it's, it's too soon to tell, I think. What, uh, what is the perception out there now about banks? Are, have they regained any standing or trust, or are we still uh, looking at them with suspicion and fear? I think many of them have regained in terms of profits and, um, and in yeah, terms no of people's there. bonuses. An awful lot of the same people have managed to regain their footing and, and go on with life as, as somewhat as it was. I think the euphoria that existed before the crash is gone, and I think there is a, a marked change in the public perception of, of the industry. And I also think that there's a change in the perception of people's desire to enter the banking industry where maybe people looked at it as a quick and easy route to success. Mm -hmm. And now there's an awful lot of emphasis in American colleges on STEM and the and the engineering and the, nece the necessity of science and, and just kind of reorienting people who are still at a point in their lives where they can alter their careers, not to just look at the financial services world as the only place to, to make your mark and be a success. When you, when you look at the government response uh, that began in the Bush administration and continued almost seamlessly into the Obama administration. What, was there another way to approach it? Was this the best idea as far as what's good for the long-term health of America's economy, the long-term health of America's banks, the long-term help of individual Americans? Yeah, I, you know, the, the, the most difficult problem that the policymakers faced at that time was how do you restore confidence? It's how do you make people want to get back into the, the financial marketplace and, and do business again? And I think, it, you know, you can have all the economists in the world, but that's the, that's the problem that I, I think they were not able to solve and perhaps they still aren't able, we're, perhaps we're still not there. And, and there is obviously a, a, a variety of opinions about how that would have been better accomplished. So I think, 
I think the, but the, the banks biggest did okay. criticism, banks certainly made out okay. In fact, the, the, the largest banks are, are larger. And, and when you look at the, the accumulation of risk in the, in the system, it's, it's actually more than it, than it was in the past. So I think that going forward, an awful lot of what happens depends on who we elect and how vigilant we are about making sure that these reforms that are, that are in the legislative process actually come to be. So whether or not they, you know, we were, we were chatting before the show about the budget debates. Are these agencies going to be funded to be able to monitor and go after people who, who don't follow the rules? Or are we going to get the, the right staffing levels to get these rules written? So let me understand what you're saying. You're saying that it, 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 right, what you just described is not saying there's perhaps a shortage of regulation. There just may be a shortage of focus on certain aspects of regulation or enforcement of regulation. Well, you know, I think everybody is going to have a different understanding of whether or not we need more regulation. I think a lot of people look at the system and it's so complicated and you'll see all the diagrams yeah. in there of it and trying to, to make sense out of all of them. It's, it is head spinning. And I think that um, people would argue at most of these crises that there actually needs to be regulatory consolidation of one kind or another. So rather than making more regulators, maybe the um, CFTC should be uh, folded into the SEC. So the two more derivatives um, and, and the stock market and all that maybe make more sense to have that. Because right now, depending on what kind of product you're talking about, it's not really clear which regulator would be the, the preeminent one. Um, another I'm having an association here with, uh, with Homeland Security, with the discussion at post 9-11 about the, the security right. or, or, or the needs and the functions were spread out among too many agencies that don't necessarily communicate. Is, are you talking absolutely, about the same thing Absolutely, yes. It's absolutely the same thing. And, and anyone who, uh, from inside or outside who looks at the regulation of our banking system just looks at this uh, plethora of organizations and says, how can this be? And, and you know, another one that people talk about, I think, um, you know, Sheila Bear's book talks about how we should just get rid of the OCC. I haven't read it yet myself, so I don't want to quote it for, uh, definitively. But I think that there are people who've looked at this system and said, maybe what we need to do is combine some of these regulators and um, and then it'll make more sense for the the banks who's involved somehow we've managed to talk about this for about 20 minutes and not use the phrase too big to fail <laughs> although we've alluded to it we talked about uh, size mattering in these in these discussions uh, what does that mean too big to fail well, if a bank is too big to fail, if it comes down, the whole financial system comes with it. So we say, you know, if you have a tree, uh, you know, the analogy everybody uses and you chop off a branch, well, you know, the tree might not look so nice. But if you slice off the trunk, then the, you know, then the whole tree comes down. And banks are so interconnected in the global economy that if a major bank that is too big, in fact, to fail would go down, well, then our whole system would come down. And people say, well, what do I care? Well, that would mean that you, the payment system would come down, which would mean that you couldn't pay your your credit card bills or your rent or your grocery bill because your credit card effectively wouldn't work. That's part of the payment system. And people say, well, I would use cash. No, you wouldn't because your ATM, you know, th the system couldn't sustain a shock like that where everyone would immediately have to go onto a cash basis. So you really do have to worry about the entire col economy collapsing when you have a firm that it takes on this enormity. And we still have too big to fail banks, correct? We do have too big to fail banks. The solution that the legislation proposed was to write kind of living wills or resolutions that uh, authority where the bank would say, if in fact we have to fail, this is how we would like to be dismembered. I guess <laughs> maybe not. This is how we would like it to go down. I think once again, the devil is in the details there in terms of when the banks actually start issuing that the their their. Um, their plans and also what the international implications of that would be because all banks now that are major banks have some international component where would who would be responsible for the deposit insurance if one of these would would the FDIC be responsible would a foreign government's deposit mm -hmm. insurance um, be responsible for these are questions that are still outstanding and make people think the problem maybe isn't solved when did this begin in American history in banking history when did the concept of too big to fail first emerge when did we and, and what led us there oh. what what changes either in regulation or in approach or in new products created these gigantic entities? Well, the political resentment of banks goes back to the founding, but I think kind of the political resentment of a particular bank, probably when people looked at the Morgan Bank at the turn of the 18th to the, or the 19th to the 20th century and the concentration of, of power there. And so I think people look at the Federal Reserve 
as, as kind of the answer to, to effectively what the Morgan Bank did, it, the concentration of power. And, and so in effect then, by that mm -hmm. time, we would have had a bank that was quote unquote too big to fail, but it was maybe not, it was performing some of the functions of a central bank itself. So I don't know whether or not we'd, we'd call it that, but really um, you start to get that um, much later. And, and what about the response and where we head next? Uh, what does your research indicate as far as, we, you seem to suggest that we're in a very, very vulnerable place still. I think we are, and I think the biggest unanswered political question that is out there is the future of the mortgage giants, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And uh, we you know, really don't pay a lot of attention to them in financial politics, but also in the study of American politics. They are arguably the largest financial institutions in our country. So why do we really them? don't? <laughs> yeah, I don't. Or what comes out comes out from very partisan one or the other side. And we really, you know, in the financial crisis, we took we we took them under the wing of the federal government, and ultimately we. We haven't had a big public discussion about what's going to happen because that's the future of the mortgage market. I know that you know you're, you're an academic, not a, a partisan. But if you were queen for a day, where would you be looking? Where where are the fixes? Where are the most acute problems that surface through your research that really we should be focused on? I think a lot of it has to do again with isolating the speculative activity of large banks and kind of doing our best to wall it off from Does from that mean regulating it more more aggressively? Well, regulating it more aggressively, but really having a conscious knowledge of protecting the deposit base of, of our financial institutions. So I think the old style bankers would talk about the great trust that they had in protecting that deposit base because ultimately with deposit insurance, taxpayers make sure that that money is going to be there. So um, ultimately when you put your money in a bank, you want to make sure that it's going to be there when you take it out. And that having that kind of sacred trust, restoring that, through our regulation is the most important thing. That you we often hear, I mean, people uh, bring back Glass-Steagall. Uh, is, is that something that you'd recommend? Yeah, well, we couldn't really bring back the, the same exact law because it would have to reflect, like I said, I mean, the, with, the, with the way that the financial services industry is structured now, you, would, you couldn't really bring it back exactly as it had been. But I think the biggest approximation has been to try to bring it, the spirit of it back through the Volcker Rule. And are we even thinking about this? And this may be, uh, unfortunately, time has flown by. I have many more questions, but we're running out of time. But uh, the, the global aspect, which you referenced several times, are we even thinking about this clearly as far as the whole new environment of this global interconnected economy? Or are we still applying old paradigms to this discussion? Yeah, I, I like the global part of it because it was actually my students at Case Western who, who were so interested in the international that I added the international chapter because of the developing crisis as it, as it spread across the world um, in the different countries. Each one of the countries has its own unique chemistry that, that brought on the financial crisis in Europe. But certainly it ultimately threatens our banking system and also our demand, our, our, our national economy is threatened by what's going on right now in the Eurozone. So it's really a big component and one that we have to pay a lot of attention to. Well, my head is hurting, but in a good way, Katie. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> no, this has yeah, been very enlightening and so much yeah. more to learn and discuss. This is Katie's new book, uh, Everything You Wanted to Know About Banks But Were Afraid to yeah. Ask. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> After the break, Michael Adler provides an update on negotiations with Iran over its nuclear program, something simple after the complexity yeah, of banks. Light. <laughs> right after this. The Wilson Center is America's living memorial to its 28th president, connecting the world of policymaking to practical options derived from the world's finest ideas, research, analysis, and honest nonpartisan conversation. Visit us on the web at wilsoncenter.org. And now we return to more dialogue at the Wilson Center. Welcome back. Reporter and Wilson Center public policy scholar Michael Adler has been following Iran's nuclear program for many years and has been closely monitoring attempts to find a diplomatic solution to the situation. In this edition of Context, he provides a review of recent meetings and a preview of the next round of talks. Let's take a look. While nothing dramatic occurred, there seems to be cautious optimism following the latest round of talks. What's your assessment? Expectations were low going in. It was just a matter of coming out of that meeting with another meeting. What happened in that meeting is that uh, the U.S. and its negotiating allies, called the P5 plus one, uh, the six permanent security council members plus Germany, presented a proposal where they a little bit softened the, the demand that this plant, which makes medium enriched uranium, which is closer to weapon grade, shut down completely. What they spoke about was suspending 
uh, the making of 20% uranium. So that was a concession. They also offered some sanctions relief where they could do trade in gold and precious metals. So those were two concessions, not major, but concessions. And the Iranians greeted both these things as positive. And uh, of course, they've got to uh, consider the proposal. They asked questions to experts later this month. And then there's another meeting in Amati in April where they will give their answer. Were there any surprises? There was not a surprise, but actually one could be, um, uh, one could be slightly surprised at how well it went. There were, there were no, uh, there were real, no huge speed bumps. There was, uh, there were no interruptions. The, the, the proposal was presented. It was uh, presented by the United States before the meeting as something that was not really a great modification of what had been proposed and rejected previously. But with the modification, the Iranians really were uh, greeted as positive. The Iranian negotiator, Jalili, was, as one diplomat told me, he was charming. He went on a charm offensive at the meeting. So it was about as good as it could have been for this meeting. What happens next? And now there will be, on March 18th, an experts-level meeting where the Iranians get to ask questions about the proposal, such as, you want us to suspend 20% enrichments. What does that mean? Um, when can we restart it? What do we have to shut down exactly? What are you expecting from us in terms of guarantees? Then when they get that information, they will have a meeting in April again in Ahmadi, in Kazakhstan. And that is where the Iranians will give their answer to the proposal. A recent Zogby poll indicates that Iran's regional standing is in decline. Could this motivate them to make a deal? I think this issue is much too big to be affected by those polls. What could affect how they negotiate is how the economy is doing, how seriously they're feeling, feeling the pain, how much they think that could lead to domestic unrest. In other words, their goal is regime survival. If they think any of these things taking place, such as sanctions which are crippling their oil sales, such as people's reaction to not being able to buy as much as they could before, when that gets to the level of hunger and hurting, that might affect the regime. But we're nowhere near that yet. Hello, I'm John Molesky, host of Dialogue at the Wilson Center. The conversation continues each week on Wilson Forum. This week, we'll hear from former U.S. ambassadors to Mexico, John Negroponte, James Jones, and Jeffrey Davidow. U.S.-Mexico relations through their eyes on Wilson Forum. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Television and Radio. Our host's Twitter feed is twitter.com backslash John Molusky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.